asking, I wanted to begin this year with a sermon um, looking at killing the giants in our lives that try to destroy us. And 1 Samuel 17 is our text. This past week, the curtain dropped on another year in our lives. 2014 will be filed on the shelf of history. in history. Our attention has already shifted to the future. 2015 is dawning on new horizon for us. Some of us are making another list of New Year resolutions, proving that hope does spring eternal. Some of us are optimistic that this year will be better than last year. Others of us in this room might be pessimistic. Scary words are being band-aid about. North Korea, radical racial tensions, global warming, nuclear threats, ISIS, and the list goes on as we listen to the news. How do we face the future? How do we keep hope alive? How do we stay optimistic when there are giants in front of us mocking our very existence all the time? This past year has had its challenges. We saw racial tensions escalate in our nation after police officers who had been involved in the deaths of two African-American individuals in New York and Ferguson and grand juries decided not to indict them. Um, and so there's tension all over the nation between races. It was a year where our city was on the news quite a bit regarding the cases of Ebola that took countless numbers of lives in different parts of the world. We heard stories of terrorism arise from the Middle East as ISIS began overtaking villages and cities and killing Christians and minorities in their path. We've seen changes in D.C. as frustration with how government is being run led to now the control of the Senate and the House being controlled by the Republican Party. We watched as rescue workers desperately try to find a missing Malaysian Airlines flight that mysteriously disappeared along with 239 passengers on board. We've seen our nation divided on issues such as immigration and marriage, just to name a few things. We've even seen the Cowboys get into the playoffs. It was a rough year for us. In many ways, 2014 was challenging. In some ways, it was like facing giants. It might have even caused us to wonder if we will ever hear the end of it. But we made it across. God has taken us to the other side. We're a little, little weather beaten. We're tired. But we saw the end of 2014 because of His grace. We have so much to be thankful for this morning. And this morning as we begin the new year, I want to take you back about 3,000 years to a valley just south of the city of Jerusalem. And in this valley, there is history. A history that is about a giant that is standing in front of the people of God. 1 Samuel 17, in that passage, you see this giant of a man that lumbers out against the people of God on a daily basis. He's the original Megatron, a massive giant by the name of Goliath. He stands nine feet tall. He wears 250 pounds of armor. His enormous bulk and armor and weapons total 600 pounds, a colossal mass of brass glistening in the sun, the Philistines' weapon of mass destruction. Every day, Goliath would strut his awesome stuff out into the field. The valley would shake as he belches and bellows as he blasphemes the name of God across the creek. Choose a man, he would yell, and let him come out and fight me. And the Israelites, meanwhile, would cower behind the rocks, mesmerized, hypnotized, paralyzed, unwilling to answer the giant's challenge. And this would go on for 40 days. Little has changed in the 3,000 years since. Every day, giants come to challenge us. We crawl out of bed and we march to battle. We bang our shields, we rattle our sabers, and we boast that this time we will beat Goliath. And all of a sudden, the giant roars and our courage fails. What giant comes against you? Goliath had four brothers. All of them were giants. See, sometimes giants come to us in packs. They come in all shapes. They come in all sizes. Their names are familiar to us just as the name of Goliath. It might be lust. It might be fear. It might be suffering. It might be shame. It might be prejudice. And others just as ominous. 
Only you know the giants that come against you. Let me encourage you this morning as we begin this new year that God has made you to be a giant slayer. Like David, you have feet of clay, and maybe you only have a few stones, and maybe you only have a sling, but with hearts ablaze with the Spirit of God, people with clay feet can topple giants. And from David's encounter with Goliath, we learn the following truth that's applicable for us in 2015. See, when others say that giants are too big to hit, people of God say that giants are too big to miss. King Saul was a mighty warrior. He was the leader of the nation of Israel. But he, the Bible says that he was taller than everyone else in the nation. But Saul was a big man with a small heart. He took a look at Goliath and he said, that dude is way too big for me to hit. David was the black sheep of the family. He was the one that everyone forgot. He was the one that everyone thought would amount to nothing. But he had a heart that was bigger than the entire nation. And he looked at the giant and he said, Goliath is way too big for me to miss. It's all a matter of perspective. A German proverb says, fear makes the wolf bigger than he is. For 40 days, the Jews would sit around the campfire exaggerating about how big Goliath was. And nine feet is nothing to sneeze at. But after a month of fear talk, the giant must have grown to about 27 feet tall in their imagination. You know, giants never get smaller over time. But the issue should never be the size of the giant. Rather, it should be the size of our God. You've got to grasp that fact if you're going to be a giant slayer. And so I want to give you three points or three, truths, three truths about David's triumph over Goliath. Number one, we can defeat every giant because the Son of God has already defeated the one that counts. We can defeat every giant because the Son of David has already defeated the only one that counts. See, this is the most crucial truth of all for us to remember. Without it, you will never defeat giants. Look at verses 8 to 11. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Goliath is using an ancient code of combat called representative warfare. See, each army would pick a champion. And then the two of these individuals would fight each other rather than the armies fighting each other. Whoever wins, wins for the entire army. Each individual not only represents his nation, but they also represent their God. See, ultimately, this was a battle between two deities. This was a battle between the God of Israel and the God of the Philistines. See, this is the great tragedy of the Valley of Elah where these people were. By refusing to fight Goliath, the Israelites, in essence, were declaring that God was not big enough to overcome the gods of Goliath. For 40 straight days, their refusal to send someone out to fight the Philistine giant is tactic admission that they have lost faith in God. And David understands the spiritual significance of the situation. In verse 26, he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? He knows what's at stake here. And he charges the giant with these words. He says, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled. See, David knows the battle isn't his to win. His confidence is in God. Little David, with his slingshot, doesn't stand a chance against a warrior giant. But if the battle is between God and the stone idols of the Philistines, 
He cannot lose. Mark this down as unalterable fact. Every battle you win on earth must first be won in heaven. Let me take this a step further. The, valley, the battle in the Valley of Elah foreshadows a battle that will take place a thousand years later on a hill outside Jerusalem. David is a model picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Jesus comes from the line of David. Like Jesus, David is a shepherd. Like Jesus, David is destined to be a king. Like Jesus, David is a prophet. Like Jesus, David is sent by his father. Like Jesus, David comes bringing bread to his brothers. And like Jesus, David is rejected by his brothers. And like Jesus, David is not impressive to look upon. In every way, David is a type of Jesus. On the other hand, Goliath is a picture of Satan. He is the accuser of the people of God. He comes to intimidate. He comes to deceive. Most of all, he comes to destroy and to kill. He is overpowering in his strength. Look at Goliath and you will remember these words. He says, Peter says, be sober, be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Goliath comes with an army of men and giants. And in the same way, Satan comes against us with armies of giants and demons. And then there are the Israelites, the people of God. They're God's army, the church militant of the Old Testament. But they cower behind rocks in fear powerless to defeat the giants. In the same way, we're powerless in our strength to defeat Satan or all demons or all the giants that come against us, whether that's lust or addictions or any other enemies. Like the Israelites of old, we too are small and weak to defeat the giants that come against us. But Jesus has come down from heaven. The greatest battle of ages is fought on a cross outside of Jerusalem. In the Bible, we see that Jesus is called the rock in the New Testament. In Genesis 3.15, when God curses Satan, he says, for, for the damage that he does to Adam and Eve, he says, the, he, Jesus will crush your head and you will strike his heel. See, on that cross, the snake strikes Satan's, Jesus' heel. A bloody spike impales his feet. But the rock crushes his head. Just as surely as the rock of David from the slingshot of David crushed Goliath's head. The Philistines went down for the count. Satan goes down for the count. He's effectively dead. He can roam. He can roar. But he has no power over those who stands against him. This is why James would write, resist the devil and he will flee from you. See, it's amazing how much smaller a giant will be when they're in a prone position. When the Israelites see the giant fall, all of a sudden, there's courage. All of a sudden, there's boldness. There's, they charge forward. They plunder the Philistine camp. David won the battle for them. And listen, in the same way, Christ has won the battle for us. He is already defeated. Satan has already been defeated. Defeated. We no longer have to cower in fear. We no longer have to be defeated by anything. We are uncon unconquerable because every enemy has already been conquered. Number two, don't procrastinate. Don't procrastinate. Giants don't get smaller with time. You don't get any bigger with time. And God doesn't get bigger with time. Every day for 40 straight days, Goliath comes out to issue his challenge. For 40 days, the Israelites sat on their hands. Three things can be said about those 40 days of procrastination. The giant never got any smaller. The Israelites never got any bigger. And God didn't get any bigger. See, but the truth is, Goliath did get bigger in their imagination during those 40 days. The faith of the people of God diminished. God became smaller in their eyes. One person wrote, wrote it this way. He said, putting off an easy thing is hard. Putting off a hard thing makes it impossible. Martin Luther said it this way. How soon, not now, becomes never. 
But you see, David didn't procrastinate. He just got on the scene, and within few hours of his arrival, he sizes up the situation immediately. He was appalled by what he saw. God's army was paralyzed by fear. King Saul was mired in negative thinking. And when David volunteered to take up the giant, listen to the words of King Saul in verse 33. He says, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been fighting men since his youth. Do you see the three negatives in Saul's response there? Number one, you're not able. Number two, you're only a boy. And then this guy's been fighting since he was young. Negative self-talk is the mother of procrastination. I can't tell you how many times I've sat or sat in meetings where things are ready to move forward, and then someone brings up a negative thing. Doubt creeps in, and then fear. Look how big the giant is. See how little we are. Think about how many people Goliath has already killed. Remember, he has four brothers, and they're giants too. Kill him, and then you got to deal with the rest of them. And so a motion is made to take this issue and move it to the next meeting. And next month, there's another motion to push it back. And what we want to do never gets done. In the business world, they call it kicking the can down the road. Politicians are very good at playing this game. But then all of us are pretty good at talking ourselves out of something. I'll start that diet tomorrow. I'll look for a marriage counselor next month. I'll get involved in community group when things get easier. I'll start a procrastinators club later. Do you remember Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind? Whenever she was faced with something unpleasant, she famously said, I'll think about that tomorrow. See, every day Goliath would come out with his challenge, and the army of Israel would say, oh, we'll just deal with him tomorrow. And for 40 days, they just kept saying, we'll just deal with it. Tomorrow, Shakespeare said, tomorrow and tomorrow, and tomorrow creeps in this pretty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. See, tomorrow will never come. Some 40 days later, the giant still lumbers out, and King Saul is still coming up with excuses. See, excuses are the tools that people use to build monuments to nothing. David would not let difficulty or excuses keep him from making history. He knew that if you say, I can't long enough, that I can't will become, I won't. David watched the giant issue his challenge one time. The second time, David was immediately running across the valley to meet the challenge. Look at verses 48 to 51. The Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, and David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put a hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. And David ran and, took the, and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out and killed him and cut his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. See, David didn't waste any time. Having committed to take on the giant, he immediately attacked. Verse 48, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Look at the sequences between verse 48 and 50. It's like bam, bam, over, out, it's finished. You blink and you missed it. Quickly, a stone goes into his sling, the sling whirls, the stone flies in the air, and with blinding speed, smashing the giant between his head. It all happens really quick. Listen, is there a giant in your life? Is there an addiction or a habit or bitterness or anger? Maybe it's an uncontrollable tongue. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's a critical spirit. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's your marriage not being where God wants it to be. Maybe it's another giant that's been coming out, maybe not for 40 days, but maybe it's been going on in your life for a long, long time. Can you be honest? It hasn't gotten smaller over time, has it? And you haven't gotten any bigger over time, have you? 
But do you realize that the God that you serve is the same all-powerful, all-wise, ever-present God that he's always been? He's never changed. So what are you waiting for? Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't wait for another day. You might wait forever. You might suffer forever when God is offering you help. Number three, finish the job. Finish the job. Not only did David deal with the giant quickly, he also dealt with him completely. Verse 51 tells us that David cut off Goliath's head. But he was already dead. Verse 50 says, David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword, he struck Without a sword in hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. The narrative is clear. The stone killed Goliath. Before David ever picked up Goliath's sword, the giant was already dead. The stone had killed him. But David wasn't taking any chances. He wasn't risking that he might have just knocked the giant out. This was a double kill. Crush the head and then cut it off. David was making doubly sure that this giant would never come back to haunt the people of God again. Listen, there's a profound, profound lesson in here for all of us. Sometimes we only partially deal with our giants. We repent of the sin, and then we go right back to that place of temptation again. We diet for a little while, and then we go back to the same heating habits. I've got a friend who says, I've got great discipline. I've lost 1,000 pounds in my life. The problem is that he keeps gaining it back and losing it, but he's lost 1,000 pounds over his life. All of us know what it's like to stun a giant with a rock, but only to find the giant coming back to us within just hours or days or weeks or months later. You're called to cut off its head. You've got to cut off the head. Not a temporary thing, but a lifestyle change. Not getting rid of a bad behavior, but finding out the root of that behavior and cutting it off. David kills Goliath. See, David should have learned from history. See, one of the reasons David became king was his predecessor, Saul, was disobedient to God. There was a battle that, David, that Saul went to fight against the Amalekites. And the prophet Samuel went to Saul and said, when you go and fight the Amalekites, you need to kill everyone. Don't leave their animals alive. Don't leave their women alive. Don't leave their children alive. Don't leave their men alive. Annihilate them. Annihilate these guys. The reason was because if you don't annihilate them, they'll eventually come back and attack you again. See, Saul didn't listen. He saved some of the men. In fact, he saved the king. And then Samuel came and asked him, why did you do this? And Samuel, Saul said, well, I wanted to take some of their stuff to sacrifice to God. And Samuel makes that profound statement, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. Do you realize that at the end of Saul's life in 1 Samuel 1, Saul was losing a battle to the Philistines, and he was, knew that he was going to lose, and he plunges his body into a sword. 1 Samuel 1 says that the person that took credit for Saul's death was an Amalekite. We don't know if the Amalekite just happened to walk by and see Saul dead and just wanted to take the credit thinking he was going to get an award. But the person that took credit for the death of Saul was someone that God had told earlier for Saul to wipe off the face of the planet. If you don't kill your sin, it will come and kill you. If you don't address your giant now, the giant will come back and attack you later. See, David should have learned his lesson. Unfortunately, he doesn't because there was another giant in David's life that he never overcame. David had a weakness for women. The Bible says that he took on one wife after another, and eventually he had a harem full of wives and concubines. He gets lazy, and 
allowing other men to go off into battle and fight his wars while he played in his palace. The boy that once killed a giant has now become corrupt and lazy. And one day when the Bible says that during that season when the kings were supposed to be at war, David was at home in the palace and he overlooks the palace window, the balcony window, and he sees a woman bathing on a nearby roof. See, Goliath had been replaced by another giant, a giant by the name of Lust. And not for 40 days, but more like 40 years, this giant had come out to challenge. The problem was David refused to fight him. Or if he did, he never cut off the giant's head. He could have fought him that night when he saw Bathsheba, but he didn't. So he had his servants go and bring Bathsheba to him. And the officials warned him and said, hey, this woman, she's the wife of one of your loyal army captains. But David refused to listen. David refused to cut off the head. David refused to fight lust. And you know the rest of the story. The consequences were devastating for him. A baby was lost in the path. His family was devastated. The nation was devastated. Listen, nobody can, get a, nobody can sin and get away with it. David had to repent. And one day he got up off the floor. The giant's head hadn't been cut off. And as long as we can get up, the giant hasn't won yet. As long as we're still in there fighting, the war isn't won or lost. And when David writes his confession in Psalm 51, he said in verse 6, God, you desire truth even in my inmost beings. Listen, he's saying something that all of us need to hear this morning. The adultery was bad. The cover-up was worse. The murder of, her love, of his lover's husband was horrific. But as bad as all those things were, David is looking for something deeper. He's looking in his heart saying, what is inside of me that caused me to do these things? What deeper thoughts and deceits are lurking deeper that led to the actions that he took? See, just saying you're sorry for the things you did wrong, just weeping in front of others might be more than just hitting, might be more like hitting the giant on the head with a rock. But you've got to go deeper. You've got to cut its head off. Or you've got to cut to the heart of the matter by going deeper. You've got to ask God to transform your heart. See, sometimes it takes time to saw off a 25-inch giant's neck, especially when it's down deep in the inner parts, even when you are unaware of its existence. Remember this. Requir killing giants, defeating giants, requires quick action, the right action, and complete action. See, that's why we need Jesus to fight our giants for us. That's why we need a company of brothers and sisters to fight alongside us. And if we will commit ourselves to victory and believe that the one who is in us is greater than all the giants in the world, then listen, there is no giant too big to miss and no believer who is too small to hit him. If the rock that we hurl is Jesus... And the power that propels that rock is God himself. There is no weapon that's formed against us that's going to prosper. See, he has already crushed the enemy for you. You don't have to live in defeat this year. You don't have to keep going through the same stuff. This morning as we come to the communion table, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart. What giant has been yelling in your life, blaspheming the name of God in your life, saying that your God is not too, power, is too weak to defeat him? What giant has been screaming at you over and over, saying you'll be defeated? What giant has been coming against you saying you'll never win? Can we begin this year by saying, we have the rock that has already defeated the enemy. We have the rock that has crushed the head of the serpent. He has won the battle for us. 
so we don't have to live in defeat. He has won the battle for us so that we don't have to keep falling and falling and falling. He has done it. He is victorious. And because he is victorious, we don't have to live in defeat. We don't have to live weak. We can trust that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that can transform our spiritual lives. He can take us from spiritual deadness and make us alive in Christ. We can live victorious lives, but it calls us to action. You can't just sit there and just hope it disappears. There is a dependence, a trust, a fight that we are called to fight. This morning as we come to the table, it is a reminder that the rock eternal has crushed the head of the serpent. Along the way, he was bruised in the battle. His body was torn to pieces. Blood was shed. It looked like he was defeated. For three days, we thought that God had died. But he rose again from the dead and for once and for all has defeated the enemy on our behalf. We are no longer his enemies. We now belong to him. We are clothed in his righteousness. We have his spirit living inside of us, but the battle has been won for us. This morning as we come to the table, would you be reminded that someone took your place? That the battle has been fought. You are victorious because you belong to Jesus. You are victorious because he gave his life for you. This table is for those who have put their faith in Jesus. So this morning, if you are a follower of Jesus, this morning, if you have given your life to him, and you have said, he is my only Lord, he is my only Savior, that I love him with all my life and I don't serve anyone else, that Jesus is my God, then this table is open for you. And I invite you, as you reflect and meditate on the words this morning, whenever you're ready, you can come and grab the elements from the table and come back to your seats and we'll partake of the table together, but let's worship.